Today I spoke with Pierre Olivier Chaubois, who is the CEO and founder of a company called ReadDoc. So these guys are doing some amazing AI work when it comes to RFPs, request for proposals. So if you're the kind of company, for example, a marketing agency that has to put out a lot of RFPs uh, to acquire work, this is the company for you. So really, when it comes to fulfilling these RFPs, you first you've got to understand what the requirements are, and everyone is usually different. You've got to go and find the information, align the information, look at your, your existing resources and um, assets, and see what you can leverage on these RFPs. This does everything for you. It, it identifies the information, it finds the people within your organization who are best suited based on their history to work on this particular project. It does everything for you seamlessly as AI. So um, certainly this is a company that you do want to reach out to if you are uh, very active when it comes to RFPs. So I hope you enjoy this great conversation. And by the way, they're based in Ottawa, which is the, uh, the capital of Canada, for those who are living outside of Canada, uh, go Canada. <laughs> it's fantastic to have you here today. So let's start with uh, your, your, your background. You built a company before Redoc called Konica, and that was, I, think, I believe, back in 2008. Tell us a little bit, bit about how you built the businesses and how you got to the point of adopting AI and letting that become a sort of a core part of uh, Redoc. Well, you know, my interest in AI actually backdate uh, starting Konica by a number of years. Um, so I did a, a minor in uh, computer science at McGill University. Uh, and after work, uh, sorry, after school, I uh, joined Ubisoft Montreal, where I worked for a couple of years on uh, big games. And part of my role was around artificial intelligence uh, of the enemies, of your teammates, uh, and so forth. I was really passionate about uh, this bleeding edge technology. But I really started to question myself as to was that the right use of technology? Couldn't we you know, leverage technology to do something more meaningful? And so that really led me to start uh, my own business. Um, so I started, uh, as you mentioned, Konica in 2008. Uh, it was a consulting business that we grew to uh, seven or eight uh, people at the, you know, at the peak. Uh, we were quite successful and we did a number of uh, AI related projects. Uh, one of them was a Turing test to figure if the person using the website was a real human or not. Uh, so that was a very intriguing project. And another one that was very successful was around um, essentially a system that would accelerate the creation of legal documents. It was not, I wouldn't call it like AI, you know, for real. It was more of an expert system. Uh, but that really gave us a glimpse as to the potential of leveraging technology to create uh, large and complex and very valuable business documents. And, you know, as part of that consulting practice, uh, one, one of the things I did was responding on RFPs, right? And uh, I have to admit that although I loved winning them, uh, I really hated responding to them. Um, and at some point, uh, I had the, you know, a lunch with the COO of a management consulting company. Uh, and at that point, we had the discussion around pain with uh, RFPs. And I pitched him that, you know, I think we could be using uh, document acceleration technologies uh, to solve your problem. So this is really how I got from AI in the video game to actually leveraging AI for the business problem of accelerating RFP responses. For, for people that aren't familiar with sort of RFPs, so requests for proposals, what is the challenging piece of it? The, the challenging is they're very long and complex, uh, right? You can have both, you know, hundreds of pages of requirements uh, that are talking about certain capabilities that you must have. So first of all, you have to understand these requirements then you have to remember all the different projects that your company did in the past. Uh, and that becomes a problem when you have multiple offices because you're not necessarily aware of who did what. Uh, just the time to bid itself is a problem. So a lot of our customers prior to using your solution, they were leaving qualified opportunities on the table because they were too busy responding on you know, other opportunities or, or just doing like billable work. And the other thing about RFPs is if you go for a large private sector or public sector, uh, they will look at compliance. So you really need to make sure that you meet the, the requirements that are there. And the slightest mistake can cost you millions of dollars. Right. No, absolutely. I think from a, from a marketing perspective, I mean, certainly from my experience, a lot of the time, the, the agencies that I've been involved with don't even uh, sort of apply because of uh, the RFP. They just think it's too much work. 
and there's still that obviously the chance that they don't get the get the business turn on time invested can can be pretty high. Let me ask you this: in terms of the the AI component, I mean, how how does that sort of factor in into Redoc? How does it help? Well, there's you know part of the problem I discussed. There, there's two parts to it. Uh, the first one is really you have a lot of content, so you've bid uh, maybe hundreds or thousands of times in the past. Uh, you have documents and contracts that you've won that are sitting a bit everywhere. Uh, you have the resumes of your top consultants or uh, or member, you know, of your organization, um, and you have your unique methodologies, and that really creates a lot of content that's really hard to come through. So leveraging, you know, AI technology, uh, Redoc can classify these documents, can segment them into reusable components, and then can figure what these components are. For instance, you know, instead of seeing a flat document, Redoc could see, oh, well, this is the resume of Mona. Uh, Mona has worked on 12 projects that are similar in the past. These were the, you know, the customers that she was working for. And so by understanding these documents at that level, uh, Redoc really creates an understanding of what your company is doing, you know, is capable of. And so the second step is when, whenever you receive a request for proposals with requirements, uh, your question, is that a good fit more for my organization? Can I bid it? What am I missing? Right? So using natural language processing technologies, we can actually read the RFP, extract requirements, understand them, and figure what really the customer is looking for, and then match these requirements to your best content. And that's a hard problem because your content, you have a lot of copies all over the place. Well, Redoc will figure which of these copies actually better m maps with what the customer is looking for. And that gives you a good starting point, but let's face it, this is just not good enough. Using boilerplate to respond to RFPs is not the way to, to win a multi-million dollar deal. So what Redoc will do is actually guide the author uh, to add some win themes and concepts that, that, that is important for the customer, but that you're not talking about. Uh, finally, you know, Redoc will allow you to, 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 to review uh, the content, and the publishing engine will, will create a beautiful proposal uh, that meets all your corporate standards without having you uh, spending too much time on styling and formatting. So that's the extent to which, uh, you know, artificial intelligence is leveraged uh, within Redoc. I can certainly see a lot of value in when you're working with, let's say, a, a global company with hundreds, if not thousands of consultants, the value in being able to quickly sort of scan who is in your company and matching the, the potential people to the project. So for example, let's say, um, the, the project involves, uh, okay, I'm, I'm speaking from a marketing perspective, you need somebody who understands uh, an element of ERP. So let, let, let's say it's, it's Oracle, but they also we also need expertise in obviously digital marketing, but it's the automotive sector is quickly scanning all our consultants to see who best matches those three key criterion when uh, looking at sort of taking on a project. So I can imagine just, just the value in that alone is, is is significant yeah, and you're totally right and when you prove your experience to the customer saying i'm the right engine agency for your needs you really want to make sure that you leverage the right project the right descriptions and you want to resonate with what the customer is looking for right so finding these nuggets these golden nuggets that maps like as closely as possible to what are the requirements and what the customer is looking for will really give your firm an edge in terms of implementation I and mean, how long or how complicated or easy is it to implement uh, Redoc? So that's a question uh, we get a lot. So we've uh, invested a lot in, in, in the onboarding process to make sure to streamline it. We have a first phase where we get our customer to value, where they can start leveraging the solution to assemble you know, beautiful documents uh, in minutes, really within the first you know, 30 to 60 days. So within 30 to 60 days, our customer, even the largest one, uh, are able to create, um, you know, smart templates uh, and derive value from the solution. Now, definitely the ingestion of the larger scale content is something that uh, will require a bit more time. And there's also the question of what it is. You want to make sure you ingest the right content, quality content. So although we don't have to, to tag or we don't have to classify, what we need to say is hint the system to say, oh, these are examples of high quality content content that I'm looking for. And then the AI will learn from these examples and then make sure to you know, bring in the solution, the right ones. And this is a process that for a small firm will, will take you know, within another 30 days done. But if you're talking about one of the big four or you know, a multinational with offices uh, uh, throughout the world, you know, you're talking about another uh, six month implementation. In terms of 
the customer? I mean, is there a an optimal company size? And do you have to have a certain amount of data? Or would, for example, you fill out the first template and that is your starting point to, to build upon? I would say we're targeting companies who would respond over 80 RFPs per year uh, as a baseline. So, so, so there need to be s some level of pain. Uh, these nice. companies, uh, well, actually all of our customers, there's a common thread, and these are companies that want to grow. They are eager to bid on more opportunities that they were not pursuing before because of lack of time, want to increase the level of quality of their bids uh, in order to win more and have a, a bigger win ratio. And so, you know, to that extent, these are companies that will generally have revenues uh, north of 15 to $20 million. Uh, they will typically have over 50 employees and they will have a practice that's a blend of uh, some public sector at every level, uh, as well as a kind of large private sector. Uh, and when you talk about banks, uh, about, you know, automotive, as, as you were saying, like these are companies that will purchase through a proper, uh, you know, procurement process. So they will typically issue RFPs. Although you, you're based in Ottawa, here in Canada, I mean, do you have clients in specific countries? Is it around the world? Is there regulation, for example, that may limit certain countries? We're a, um, you know, early stage business. Uh, so we have uh, marquee customers uh, in, in Canada and the States. Uh, and right now, we're, our focus is really in North America. Um, in these two countries, uh, there is no regulatory uh, requirements for, you know, the bidding. It's really about creating quality bids for these customers. Uh, from an AI perspective, uh, you know, a lot of what we do involves natural language processing. So you need models around languages. So we're building models around French and English currently uh, with, uh, the, you know, the view of, of potentially supporting uh, German in the future. Uh, so our early markets will be, uh, you know, states. Uh, Canada, uh, UK, uh, France, uh, as well as Australia. Interesting. I mean, the French has to be a huge advantage as well, because I imagine that's probably one of the, the neglected markets by many of the North American companies. It is. And, and that's part of our strategy, um, you know, build a foothold in, in a market where uh, we're really unique. In, in Quebec, for instance, we, we have a good traction with large uh, IT consultancies uh, in, in, in Quebec. Um, and, and, you know, going from Quebec to France, France is actually quite a big market. You know, there's 70 million uh, people and, and the way they buy uh, product, you know, product and services is, is very uh, structured, right? They have a structured mindset, uh, which makes it harder to sell, uh, which makes it, uh, you know, uh, more valuable to use a solution that can accelerate the process. So let me ask you, I mean, you're obviously doing some fantastic work around Redoc. I appreciate that it's you, you've been in business just a little over a year, doing some exciting stuff already. But tell me, in terms of sort of your, your experience uh, over the last 10, 15 years working in the sort of multiple aspects of AI, where do you see uh, sort of the AI trends going in your business and also business in general? So what I've noticed over the years uh, you know, back in my days at Ubisoft, really, AI was like like in-house, right? We would build like custom engines that the company would hone and, and we would figure things out. Uh, what we see today in 2017 is really there's, you know, there's a democratization of tools um, that enable more and more companies and startups to leverage uh, AI or, or AI-like technologies uh, to, you know, create products and services. Uh, so this is really amazing uh, with libraries like OpenAI, like Google TensorFlow. Uh, one we use is a Stanford Core, Core NLP, for instance. Uh, so, so there's more and more services that, that are leveraging these technologies. So it's, it's, it's more accessible uh, and it's more pervasive. Uh, so that's why we hear you know, more about it and, and you'll see it more and more everywhere. Uh, what I'm very interested in, you know, I didn't mention that, but one of my first uh, job was actually brain-computer interfaces. So we would monitor brain waves and then try to, you know, uh, essentially control a game with your brain. And, and that is, you know, this is the kind of the ultimate, like your brain talks to the computer. But, you know, the step before is really having a human machine interaction that, that's much richer. Uh, so whereas in, in the past you needed to create complex interfaces, uh, you're seeing uh, AI being applied to chatbots, for instance, where you can have a conversational, you can have a conversation, right, with your bank or with your retail, uh, where through words they understand what you want and then you know provide some some answers to it. Alexa is another good example. Uh, 
Uh, I've used recently a solution called X.AI as a virtual assistant to set up meetings. Uh, you just have to CC the system uh, as you would do with a with a real assistant, and then the, person, the, the, the you know the AI will actually set you a meeting in your calendar. Uh, if you're not available, it, it will go back to the person and say, "Hey, sorry, uh, Pierre was not available. Do you have another time slot? He, he happens to be available, you know, Monday." And, and that really makes the AI, you know, the interface with the computer like very seamless, and that's a big trend that that I see uh, coming and and you know increasing. Another one that I've not read too much, but I. I think it will affect a lot is essentially the evolution of uh, dedicated computing instance like for uh, neuronal network and deep learning and really AI-based applications. So back in the days, it started with like CPU, right? You would have a compute processing, computer processing unit. Uh, then a GPU came along for vectors and we could start to see like 3D and amazing immersive environments. And now what we're saying, what we're seeing is a lot of companies, including Google, that's creating a, a tensor proce processing unit that's really good at per, like traversing graphs and applying like graph computation. And that simulates, you know, neural networks at a velocity that was not possible before. So all the, the, the advances in software that were done on AI are actually becoming more and more supported by hardware, uh, which will, to my to my, you know, from my perspective, will will really change how the software behaves, uh, in in the way that it's going to impact the the industry. Let me ask you a final question: What advice would you give to the first time AI user? What should they be looking at? What should they be doing? What would you recommend? You know, while I look for a first time business that is is looking at at AI, uh, and if we talk about it, you know, a marketing agency, for instance, uh, that that is like, you know, wondering like, can I can I use it? Like my advice here is really just start adopting cloud-based software. Uh, and what you will see is all the vendors, you know, anyone producing software nowadays uh, will start embedding AI capabilities uh, within their solution. So if you're, a, you know, an agency and you, you have a CRM, uh, well, Salesforce, for instance, just announced uh, Einstein, uh, and I think it's a partnership with IBM as well, right? So just by leveraging cloud-based solutions that are, you know, you, you're, you're subscribed to a, a piece of software that is maintained and upgraded and, and you, that you grow with, well, all these subscriptions that you leverage will start to leverage, you know, AI. So uh, <laughs> it's, uh, I'm not sure that really answers the question, but, uh, you know, leveraging cloud-based, like, will, whether you want it or not, like, enable you and, and provide you with AI capabilities. It's a pretty good bet. I mean, bet on the big guys who are doing it. You may not even be aware that you're using AI because it's... A pretty much seamless within the, within the system as it segments and helps to personalize and that. So I think, I think it's great advice for any, uh, any company looking to adopt AI for the first time. Any cloud-based, I think even the small ones like us, you know, we're, we're a startup uh, and we leverage AI. So, just, so I don't think it, you have to only bet on the big ones. Also uh, trust the small ones that are very innovative. Yeah, I, I stand corrected. <laughs> <laughs> So I meant, yeah, I, I just assume cloud for me, sky big. Yes, uh, you're absolutely right. It's not, uh, it's not just the the sort of the big the big five. It's uh, there's a lot of cloud solutions like Redoc that are that are providing great value and introducing AI in sort of under the hood, seamless ways. So SaaS really is the way to go to play it safe. If you're new to uh, the sort of implementation of AI, this is certainly one way to do it. Go with a, a big SaaS or small SaaS <laughs> supplier uh, who automatically will take care of the AI aspects for you in their particular solution. Pierre-Olivier, thank you so much. It's fantastic to see what uh, Redox doing, how you're reimagining RFPs, saving people a tremendous amount of time and money. Um, I wish you the best and I look forward to speaking with you again in the foreseeable future.